what are the things that you see that are not being done that could stop the uh, sliding into, you know, what happened in the 1930s? You know, I'd like to say that what Obama did in the case of the Spratly Islands, for example, when the China just grabbed it from the Philippines, Obama stood by. And uh, South China Sea militarization. I mean, the fact is that the Chinese have got away so far with all their with all their bluster and their bullying and their tactics. So you can't really forgive them for believing they'll get away with a lot more. You know, and they have, their agenda is open. It's not hidden. Xi Jinping, at least give him credit, he is basically very transparent about his agenda. The Chinese Communist Party is a Han supremacist party. It believes in the supremacy of the Han race. And it genuinely believes that if the Han race dominates the world, the whole world will be a happier place. The whole world will be a better place. If all of us come under the domination of the Han people, we will all be much more happy than what we are now under, you know, whatever, I don't think call it domination in the case of democracies, under the, the, the leaders that we have, which they believe that. It's not something that they're putting on for effect. They believe that today they are capable, they are big, they are strong enough to do what they want to do. The, this alternate reality is becoming stronger and stronger. And the stronger and stronger it becomes, the more traditional tactics completely fail against it. Now, you know, your program is China unscripted. China is very scripted. And that, of course, is their Achilles heel. Because they will fight a war, an AI war. A war that, you know, AI machines say this tactic, this tactic. And if the enemy confuses them by going into entirely different tactics, you know, flexible, improvisation, then... And if it's beyond the capacity of the machine to follow, if it's entirely new tactics, well, then the machine is going to be, you know, in, in trouble. Their army has been trained to fight like robots on a prearranged plan as per artificial intelligence, you know. And the minute you see sudden, unexplained, almost random, almost irrational alterations and changes in those plans, well, what happens? The plan falls apart. That's what happened in Russia. You know, fine. I mean, thank, uh, Americans helped in a huge way. Huge amount of material was given to the Russians. But the fact is that the Russians improvised. Stalin realized that control over the Stavka was, uh, was wrong. He gave them freedom, complete freedom. He took that away after the war, but gave it to them during the war. And as a consequence, each general improvised, you know, whether it is Zhukov, whether it is Timoshenko, whether it is any of these generals, they improvised. And they would improvise on their own because they have the authority to do so. You know, Marshal Zhukov would say, go ahead. I'm, I'm not here for you. You guys go ahead and do it. And this, frankly, destroyed Hitler's effectiveness because they were used to a certain predictable response from the enemy side. And when the enemy failed to react predict predictably, they could not respond adequately at all. So I don't really like to say that the same weakness is there in China, as I see, it, you know, because they've not really fought a war. In a war, as I mean, you have to, you know, things happen which you don't plan for. In a, in, a, in a video game or in a computer simulation, it never happens. Everything is within the box that you've already worked out. Anything outside that box is foreign to you. So once it's foreign to that AI machine, now, for example, they have simulations of personality, your personality, my personality, Matt's personality. I'm sure they'll have perfect simulations of that based on our social media tracking, our profiling, etc. Now, if we go there and behave in a different way, I mean, they won't know how to react because they have been, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean I'll give you an example. My wife... Uh, Lakshmi Bai, her family has had a long relationship with Imperial China because she was the royal family of Travancore. For hundreds of years ago, the emperors used to give gifts to the Travancore family and the Travancore family would send gifts to them. So there's been a long relationship and there's a certain degree of sentiment. So she was the, the, first, the, the, the first delegation invited uh, by China after the... Uh, this Pokhran test or whatever you call it, 
was composed of, uh, of, a, of a very famous uh, a gentleman called Subramanian Swami, a Harvard-educated professor, then a lady called Chandraleka, and my wife, uh, Lakshmi Bai. And she went there. Now, the Chinese uh, assigned somebody to Chandraleka who was knew all the shops in town. You know, the uh, whatever, design shop, jewelry shop, whatever. My wife, all the traditional arts and crafts in town. So they knew exactly what they wanted, what they liked, down to the menu, what they liked. You know, that somebody likes speaking duck, they know it, and lo and behold, you're served speaking duck. If you're a vegetarian like me, you're only served vegetarian food. So let me tell you, but they've studied all that, but the limitation of that is sometimes we are mavericks, if we are eccentrics, and we follow maverick and eccentric policies, that may throw them a little bit off balance. So I'm quite confident about the democracies holding their own. I mean, I know we, uh, it was throughout, in India, for example, we're talking about the Indian military. And yes, the Chinese were saying, oh, the military, nothing, nothing to worry about. This is the only military that has defeated Wahhabi forces in irregular combat. It did not work in Afghanistan. It did not work in Iraq. It did not work in Libya. It did not work in Syria. Our military held them and defeated them in Kashmir. And they did it without aircraft, without helicopters, without bombs, without artillery, only with sidearms and with rifles. No bombs, no rifles, no helicopters, nothing of that kind, no artillery. And our military succeeded. Why? Because of our focus on mind space. I, I, I don't want to take too much time, but I'd like to say one of the mind spaces was there, were, there are three or four crossing routes uh, for jihadis coming into India. They were told in Pakistan that Muslims are not safe in India. They can't pray in India. Mosques were built along these crossing routes so that whenever a jihadi crossed the frontier, unseen, that person would come across a mosque and see people peacefully at prayer and say, my God, I was told that Muslims can't pray peacefully in India and these people are praying peacefully. So that will knock some of the credibility of what the indoctrination they got, some of the confidence of the people who entered inside and finally enough will be knocked to enable them, frankly, to be sent back home on a one-way ticket. So which the, our army succeeded in doing. You know, that's why I'm not worried about another invasion from Pakistan. The Pakistan, they, they don't say that. They know it. And that's why, you know, I'm quite confident of our military. As far as the Chinese are concerned, it's, you know, it's not a video war that our soldiers are fighting. It's a real war, I can tell you. So as far as they're concerned, and I am very confident, President Biden, Prime Minister Modi is on the same page where it comes to the outcome of any Sino-Indian conflict are absolutely on the same page.